Good morning, everyone. My name's Liam. I'm a consultant with Marshall Day Acoustics in Melbourne, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on the design of the Sydney Coliseum Theatre. This is the second in a series of talks from Marshall Day regarding performing arts facilities. Make sure you keep an eye out for the next one, which will be on Wednesday, 15th of July, and we'll tackle topics such as fly towers and overstage machinery. More about that at the end of the talk. If you have any questions throughout today's webinar, then please write them in the Q&A panel, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring this throughout the talk and we'll answer any questions at the end. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, my colleague, Matthew Otley. Matthew is an associate and managing consultant with the Sydney office of Marshall Day Acoustics. He holds a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering from the University of Sydney and has 20 years of experience in acoustic consulting. Matthew has had involvement in a wide range of projects in areas ranging from performing arts, education, hospitality, commercial, civic, industrial, transport, and infrastructure. Matthew currently sits on the executive of the Association of Australasian Acoustical Consultants, the AAAC, and is involved in the review and preparation of guideline documents. He also hosts the Talking Acoustics podcast, which I can highly recommend you, you all seek out, which shines a light on the art and science of acoustics and is available at iTunes or www.talkingacoustics.com. And so over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Liam. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, the uh, presentation today is on the Sydney Coliseum Theatre at West HQ, uh, which uh, was opened at the end of last year. Um, We'll also, as part of this um, talk, we'll cover some of those questions uh, that come up in the design process and a bit about when they need to be answered and some of the critical points um, in design of uh, performing arts centres generally. So we'll uh, talk about what some of those early decisions, design decisions that need to be made, uh, and briefing decisions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, building envelope, uh, mechanical services, the room acoustic design, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, orchestra shell um, that was put in at, uh, at the Coliseum. Uh, so the, um, the client out there was West HQ, formerly uh, the Rudy Hill RSL, and the site already is quite developed. It includes, in addition to the club, uh, a hotel, uh, bowling alley, um, there's a the, uh, quite a big um, gymnastic and aquatic centre, fitness club, all, all the bits and pieces um, that go with a with a big uh, club like that. So, uh, and they already had a uh, some uh, smaller venue um, for, um, for concerts and so on, um, but they really wanted to embark on this um, major um, performing arts project. So a little bit about the team, uh, Cox uh, Architecture um, were involved and, and did a pretty amazing job, both their architectural team as well as their interiors team. And I think they're seeing um, quite uh, good feedback in terms of um, awards um, from, the, from the project. Uh, GWA were the mechanical consultants and Michaela Gennardo um, led that team. Marshall Day Entertech did full theatre de design uh, for the project. And Micah Johnson, who led that team, will be giving a talk in two weeks time um, uh, on, uh, on more on the theatre side. There's a whole separate talk in that. Uh, and Hanson Youngkin were the builders who uh, did a pretty amazing job um, on the site, given the uh, the complexity of the building and the pressures they are under. So the site, uh, you can see in this aerial photo, this is before uh, the development uh, commenced. So it was it, it, where you see that car park at grade. Uh, it has a rail line to the south of the site. It has the main club you can see on the, uh, the western side there to the left of the page across the road. Uh, it has roads surrounding the site on all sides. 
and there's a residential area uh, to the northeast uh, to the sort of top right of the page as well as to the south across the railway line. So there's some early decisions to be made in a project like this um, which is really at the sort of the return brief or the, the feasibility um, study stage. Um, and that's really looking at what is the venue for? Uh, what sort of events or music or performances are we looking at hosting? Uh, how big does the venue need to be? How many seats? Uh, what sort of flexibility um, we need out of the space? Is it, is it a concert hall that just does orchestral performance? Or is it a multi-purpose venue? Um, and what what does that entail? What, what are the uses that need to be covered? Then there's a whole lot of requirements about the, the technical side. Do we need a fly tower? Do we need an orchestra pit? What are the requirements for the wings? Um, and then the ancillary spaces, how much back of house? Um, is it a theatre that um, houses uh, a production company and they need workshop facilities to build sets? Um, do they need conference spaces? breakout rooms, all that sort of thing. Um, access is a, is a big one um, that needs to be thought about at that point too. Uh, how, how do we get um, trucks into the site? How does the loading dock connect to the, the theatre? That's something that um, if it's not thought of early in the, uh, in the briefing um, can sometimes get lost and working with the site constraints uh, is the other thing. A lot of these decisions um, may, well, all of them really come before the architectural design starts and sometimes before the architect is appointed. Um, these decisions about how big the venue is and what it will do uh, will inform the budget uh, and the site requirements. And some of these may be informed by uh, business case uh, and theatre planning input and, and that sort of thing. So decisions that need to be thought about at least very early on. Uh, in terms of, of this project, West HQ uh, had, um, they had, as I say, an existing performance space in the club, uh, but, and they didn't have an operator on board for the new venue, but they did have some pretty clear thoughts about what they were trying to achieve. Uh, so these, these are actually quotes from the, I think the second design meeting uh, that we ever had. Uh, and these are from the club. So they wanted a theatre that brought CBD acts out to Western Sydney. They identified that quality sound and acoustics were very important uh, because it drew artists back to play at the venue. Um, and they were already thinking even at that very early stage about uh, movable seats as an option to allow the theatre to become a multi-purpose or multi-function venue. So of those early decisions, they identified the venue was for rock and pop concerts, which is what they already sort of hosted, um, but on a much bigger scale. Uh, musical theatre was a real focus for them. And uh, they also were thinking about conferences and trade shows and how uh, they might bring that commercial trade um, to the venue. Uh, how big and how many seats? Well, that was quite informed by the focus on uh, musicals and, and bringing the big musicals out of the CBD. So uh, when we get to the next slide, you'll see that that's sort of informed by the venues that they were trying to pull, um, pull those shows from or, or have, have those shows do a second run in the Western suburbs. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about the, the use uh, or the facility of having a flat floor venue and whether that might be um, something that was in the main auditorium or a second space. Um, and if they did go down that path, what sort of additional breakout facilities um, they would need for to host conferences, for example. And the other big question for them was what, it, what use could they make of their existing facilities? They had a lot of commercial kitchens and so on in the main club and they didn't want to um, duplicate things that they didn't need to. So, as I said, a lot of the focus was on bringing the large scale musicals out of the CBD. And that was 
really either from the Sydney Lyric or from the Capitol Theatre. The Lyric has a capacity, a couple of sh seats shy of 2,000, and the Capitol's just shy of 2,100. So it was very quickly identified that, that 2,000 was the, the magic number, um, and that obviously informs a lot about the, the size and the, um, uh, the capacity of the venue. So the next question then was, knowing that we need to fit that many seats in, what would the shape of the room be? So there were a number of options worked through um, with the architect and with the uh, theatre consultant um, to try and identify what was going to be the best option. Uh, this was option one that was looked at. It's a shoebox uh, shaped theatre, that just, it's just a rectangular room basically. Um, you see the orchestra pit is shown in red, the retractable seating area in green. Um, to get the capacity with a shoebox uh, shape room, uh, you end up with a very wide, um, a wide theatre, uh, which is not so great for acoustics. And the other problem is that th that width makes it much wider than the proscenium. And so the proscenium uh, being this uh, uh, stage opening here, these uh, side, uh, the, the, the side over here basically blocks the reflections that we want to get off the side walls. And those lateral reflect reflections, which are the reflections that come to our ears from the side are very important uh, in giving us a quality acoustic. So this would have been the section in option one, um, three tiers, quite tall, quite steep seating rakes. Um, something like this. Uh, we then looked at option two, which was a coffin shaped um, uh, two tier uh, theatre, potentially a wider fan, um, which gives less of those lateral reflections um, to the front section of the stalls. Um, th we, th with the coffin shape, you get um, some of those stronger lateral reflections though to the rear. Uh, section of the seating. Um, so that was something that we did like. Um, we're now back to, to two tiers, which uh, is, I think is a bit more comfortable for the, the venue. Um, and then we looked at option three, which is, which is sort of what we landed on. It's a little bit of a combination of two and three, but it's, it's more three. And that's a truncated shoebox shape. Uh, with two tiers. Um, and the reasons we went down that path were that every seat has excellent sight lines uh, to the stage. Uh, the maximum distance uh, from, the, from the stage um, is around 32 metres, I think, to the back row of seats, uh, which is pretty good given the capacity of the venue. Um, and so in section, this was what that concept looked like. And similar to the, um, this is the capital, uh, which is obviously one of the reference venues. The other thing was that even at that very early stage, um, the design team was looking at how um, we'd maximize that flat floor use. Um, you know, this is looking at sort of tables for a banquet mode, um, it was obviously at the forefront of um, the design, design team and the client's minds. The ancillary spaces were also something we were thinking about at that point. Um, you need to think about a, with a building like this, how you make the whole building work for multiple uses. It's obviously a very um, costly piece of um, built infrastructure for whoever's uh, paying for it. And to try and make it uh, work as much as possible and not just for um, you know, two hours in an evening for a show. It was important. Um, we ended up with a rehearsal space that, that can be separately hired uh, in the venue. And the other thing that we were always conscious of was the foyer and making that a space that might work for other uses. So having um, gone through some of those initial questions about uh, really briefing questions and conceptual questions, uh, we started to think about the design decisions. Uh, and one of the first ones uh, 
to be looked at is the building envelope. Uh, very critical to make um, those investigations early because it has such big implications on both the structure uh, and the cost um, of the building. Um, breakout noise is one of those things that needs that the building envelope needs to contain. So um, obviously, as I said, we had residents uh, across the road and, you know, big, loud rock and roll inside. So um, that was something that needs to be pretty carefully considered, particularly given the huge areas involved um, that have such high noise levels just inside them that we're trying to contain. So the roof ceiling structure um, and then the auditorium envelope being the, the, the walls around the actual internal um, auditorium versus the building envelope being the actual envelope of the building, the facade, um, and, and using both of those uh, to our advantage. Uh, it also had to obviously deal with break-in noise um, and the three critical things for us were the rail noise, the road noise, and also uh, rain noise, obviously with a such a big roof area and a metal deck roof, um, it, uh, it can generate uh, a lot of rain noise, um, which obviously is disturbing to a show. And given the spans in a theatre of this size, uh, it's not typically, uh, you won't typically get slabs um, that'll span that whole roof, or if you do, it's very costly uh, route to go down. So this is um, just to give you an idea of uh, what we did there for the, the walls. Um, the theatre envelope details seen on the left, uh, it's a speed panel um, construction. That was driven by early contractor involvement by the builder uh, who preferred speed, speed panel as the most uh, cost effective solution. And so we had a 78 mil speed panel, an air gap, and then a separate stud with some plasterboard on it. Um, as our uh, theatre envelope wall. And um, just going back to that idea of theatre envelope versus building envelope, um, the, uh, there's different levels of isolation required between the theatre and what's going on in the foyer. And then the theatre to external noise in terms of uh, breakout noise and also um, road and rail noise. And so balancing the performance of those two um, lines of defense uh, is important, um, both to get the result that you're after, but also to keep the cost um, at, a, at a minimum. The uh, roof ceiling construction we went for was based on an Ortec Dura panel uh, system. Uh, we had two layers of the uh, Dara panel, it's a compressed straw. Uh, each of those was backed with a layer of FC sheet uh, with quite a large air gap between the two. And that air gap is very important to get the low frequency, the, the, the base um, isolation out of that system. Uh, and one of the advantages of that uh, Ortec Dara system was that they could they can assemble um, cassettes of, of the ceiling on the ground and then lift them and drop them into place rather than trying to do all of the construction at height. Um, so that was uh, that's obviously an advantage of that system from a construction perspective. Now. Mechanical systems, um, these we really needed to make some, uh, some early design uh, decisions in terms of direction uh, for the mechanical systems. Obviously in a space uh, a performing arts building, uh, the mechanical systems are pretty complex uh, and there's a lot of work that goes in to get them right. And the more those decisions can be made early in the process, uh, the easier the implementation is. So um, supply and return air to the auditorium uh, is obviously uh, a critical thing. We want very low uh, noise levels um, from the mechanical services when you're in the auditorium watching a show. And there's a lot of control, not only of the noise that comes from the mechanical units down the duct, 
but also the airflow noise um, in the duct and out of the diffuser. And we'll go through that in a little more detail. Um, smoke exhaust uh, from the auditorium is always a big question in a performing arts building like this. And we'll touch uh, on that a bit more. Uh, the other thing are, are, are obviously the plant rooms internally and externally. Um, similar to what you'll deal with on any uh, building, but obviously in terms of the external plant, you can have quite a lot of plant to try and uh, control a room as big as the, the sort of scale we're talking about. And in terms of internal plant, uh, you'll often have plant rooms that back onto uh, a theatre or a very sensitive area, so treating those can be difficult. So in terms of the uh, supply air to the auditorium, traditionally um, the low noise targets in theatre are achieved um, using an under seat uh, displacement ventilation sy system so that the air goes into a plenum underneath the seats and then trickles out um, into the audience. It's, it's low velocity, it's low noise. Um, it's an approach that's been taken for a long time, uh, is well proven. Unfortunately, it was not possible in this instance due to that the retractable seating deck um, that we couldn't drive the air up through um, that seating, retractable seating deck because it's, it's not a sealed plenum. Uh, and so we had to look for an alternative um, approach. So what we ended up with were overhead uh, supply. Um, you see in blue there, uh, they're the supply ducts blowing the air down into the auditorium. Now, remembering at the front of the auditorium, um, all of those uh, supply diffusers need to be high enough that they don't block the line of sight from the back row of seats. They also need to blow the air down to the, the front uh, stall section of seating. And when that seating in the stalls is retracted to go to flat floor mode, they need to blow it down even further. Um, so that diffuser solution becomes very complicated. Um, the throw distance that you get varies depending on whether it's a theater or a flat floor mode, as I said, but it also varies depending on whether you're trying to heat or cool the room, because uh, it's harder to push that hot air down into a cold room than it is to throw cold air, which wants to fall. Um, the acceptable noise level uh, or our targets differ uh, depending on the different type of events, for example, a theater, versus a trade show or a banquet will have um, a different, uh, uh, more sensitivity for the theatre use. The heat loads in the room will vary a lot. Um, if you've got a full house versus, you know, a 200 seat banquet, uh, it's obviously um, a lot less heat being generated by the audience. And so there's a need to balance uh, the noise targets, the diffuser selection, um, the operating mode, and in some cases, the ability to preheat the room um, prior to a show um, before the people come in. So we ended up using a range of uh, diffusers um, throughout the space, but um, the ones that did, I think, the hardest work were these ones above the stalls or above where the retractable seats were. And they're a Krantz uh, variable twist uh, outlet diffuser. You can see it in the picture up the right at the top there. And then uh, the image from the catalog. And that was uh, what we used um, to get the air down to that front section. But a lot of work went into that and, and, and um, over a large time period to try and get all that to work. So just one of those things you need to think about in terms of the, the time and how long that's going to take um, when you embark on that sort of particularly an above um, supply system. Now, the other thing I just wanted to touch on was in terms of mechanical was smoke exhaust. Um, 
in particular the theater this size, you'll always need some sort of smoke, emergency smoke extract um, solution to get the smoke out of uh, a burning building. Um, the smoke exhaust fans themselves only run in emergency mode. Uh, so then they don't have critical noise targets like the rest of the mechanical systems, but they do still have to meet uh, internal noise levels. There's an Australian standard that specifies levels that you need to meet in emergency mode. And I think that's really to stop people um, panicking and being confused in an already um, high stress environment under a fire mode. But those fans, uh, it's typically fans in, a, in a, um, an auditorium of this size, they also uh, effectively are a, a direct coupling between our highly um, insulated um, performance space and the outside world. So we've just built these big walls and ceiling constructions to keep the noise in and out. And we're punching a hole um, right through those elements. Uh, that's the air path. So those, Fans, even though they're not in use during a show, we still have to stop the noise that comes through that, that ductwork um, and breaks out through that ductwork. So you end up with a heavily attenuated air path. Um, and just for some context, I think those fans in that image, and there's five of them, I think they're about 12, 1.2 metre diameter each, um, just to give you a sense of scale of the issue. Um, and the other thing that, that sometimes get lost is uh, you've also got to make that air up somewhere else. So if you're pulling that much air out of the space, there'll be some other path at a different point, which is letting that much um, air into the space. Um, and I won't go into the details of that in this talk, but uh, something to consider in this sort of project. So, uh, moving on to the room acoustics and some of the early design decisions that need to be made there. Um, in this venue, there were clearly identified that the multiple uses, um, being a show theatre with tiered seating uh, for musicals, um, musical performance venue with a flat floor, mostly for rock and pop shows, and then a flat floor banquet mode. Um, it's in, interesting to note here that, that symphonic music uh, was not identified as a, as a significant or, um, or really a, a use that they envisaged uh, was coming. Um, so we set some, some targets uh, early on for what we were trying to achieve acoustically in terms of the reverb time and the clarity and the background noise levels. Um, the room was designed for natural acoustics, so unamplified as well as amplified, but uh, with, with the primary focus being on amplified shows. So it's a smaller volume overall, the room size is smaller, and with a shorter reverb time than you would find in, for example, a concert hall that was a, a dedicated to um, orchestral or symphonic music. So a, a design biased towards um, the amplified use of the space primarily. Um, this is just looking at some of the uh, early surface finishes um, that we looked at to, to communicate to the architects about what we were trying to achieve. Um, the seats in an auditorium are the most acoustically absorptive elements in the room. Um, we tend to try and get a seat that is about as absorptive acoustically as uh, when a person's sitting in it as to when it's unoccupied so that if the venue is um, half full it doesn't sound radically different because we're losing the absorption of the of the half of the crowd that's not there now given that the seats are the most absorptive element, where we've got a retractable uh, seating section, that means that a significant amount of uh, acoustic absorption is lost when those seats are retracted. So you'll note in this, uh, this image that triangular uh, section 
uh, on the side walls is shown absorptive as opposed to the sort of golden yellow uh, section that's that's not absorptive and that that little per, um, purple or blue triangle um, is there so that when those seats are retracted um, that part of the wall becomes exposed it's hidden when the seats are out and that absorptive wall treatment adds back in some of the absorption that we lose when the seats are retracted. Uh, you'll also see there's a note there, that the, there's a curtain that comes down over the retracted seats, again, to add in some more absorption. Um, in the rest of the space, we have some absorption on the stage, um, just so the stage house isn't too, uh, too reverberant. Uh, we have some absorptive treatment on the rear walls um, to stop the uh, potential late reflections that might go from the stage all the way to the back of the room and then come back at quite a delay to the stage. And you can also see there uh, we'd specified a series of acoustic banners along the side walls. Um, there's another image of those there looking from the back of the auditorium down towards the stage. It's about 150 square metres. Uh, of Jan's motorised um, double layer cloth banners. And the idea there is that um, they can be retracted for um, uh, shows like um, symphonic music, for example, where we want as much reverberation in the space as possible and uh, brought down to, inc to, to increase the amount of absorption in the room and reduce the rever reverberation time for uh, rock and pop shows, for example. Now, it was a constantly evolving design. Uh, the venue management team were appointed about a year before the opening of the venue. And to give some context, I started on this project in 2014, and it was finished 2019. So we'd We've been through about four years of design and construction uh, at the point that the, the actual operators of the venue came on board. And the proposed music program was different um, to what had originally been envisaged um, by the club. Um, and also the technical requirements therefore evolved. So one of the things that came in in that last year was an immersive audio system. Now, uh, traditionally, you'd have one or two speaker arrays installed in a venue of this size um, and, and mixed to mono generally. Um, what went in was this, uh, this immersive audio system by L Acoustics. It's an L ISA 5 array. So there's five speaker arrays across the front and there's another two uh, subwoofer clusters that you see um, between which is just to the right and left of center um, and what that allows is that um, the mix on stage follows uh, the location of the performer uh, so if you've got a, uh, a saxophone for example on stage right um, the sound will come out of the speakers on the right hand side of the stage. So as you, from the audience perspective, um, the sound is coming from uh, the same point as where the musicians are. Um, the feedback from L Acoustics was that they could run the system at quite high uh, volumes without distortion due to the natural acoustic design of the room. Um, and, and my personal take is that the, uh, it's, it's probably the best house sound system I've heard in a, in a multi-use rock pop venue. Um, it's, it's very impressive. The other big change um, that was added in that last 12 months was that symphonic music was added um, to the, the, the normal program. Um, there was a, a lot of demand for that type of venue, particularly um, from the Sydney Symphony Orchestra uh, with the Sydney Opera House um, closing for renovations at about the same time as this venue was opening. Um, uh, an orchestra shell uh, 
was definitely required. As soon as we found out that, that symphonic music was coming, we knew that we needed to build an orchestra shell that is, um, that's basically a, a semi-solid structure uh, that goes around and above the orchestra to try and get the energy from the stage out into the auditorium and not have it lost up in the fly tower. Um, the aim was really to get the orchestra as far forward um, to the front of, of the thrust or the front, front of the pit as deep into the room as possible, uh, no matter what size the orchestra was, and then work backwards from that front um, the front of the pit and build a shell, uh, a modular shell of the size required for that particular orchestra so that they didn't go any deeper into the fly tower than they needed to. Um, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra had some uh, requirements or, or what they were looking for from a shell as well and they wanted some openings for lighting and, and so on. Now, uh, given the time constraints um, and also the fact that a shell was not budgeted for, um, we worked with the, with the club and the operators uh, to design uh, a modular shell that could be constructed locally. So on the left hand side is our sort of concept uh, to them, which is basically a, a set of um, uh, separate um, panels that could be configured uh, to a depth and height um, as required by the particular visiting orchestra. Um, normally for an orchestra shell, because you want to reflect the energy back out into the audience, the shell itself should not absorb any of the noise. And so normally that requires a thick, um, dense, heavy material for the shell so that um, the shell panels don't resonate and absorb the low frequency energy particularly. Um, in this case, we wanted to fly the panels in and out on the existing um, fly system. And so there was a, a weight capacity per winch uh, in terms of how much each of those panels could weigh. So we uh, came up with a lightweight um, system based on a curved panel of uh, a couple of layers of MDF, so quite light on a, on a steel and timber frame. You can see on the right hand uh, side there, the curved panel. Um, and so that could then be flown in and out on the existing, uh, existing uh, winches. Uh, that's just an image of the, um, the shell in place uh, with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. Another image there. Uh, and it, it really turned out very well um, and uh, was done on a very tight time frame and a limited budget. And um, uh, I was very impressed what they, uh, they managed to do. Uh, just in terms of the um, technical results, um, some of the reverberation times there uh, and the clarity. Um, so we achieved basically what we're looking for in terms of the um, acoustic metrics. Um, for the uh, acoustic consultants in the audience, that's the, uh, the spectrum uh, of the reverb time uh, with and without the banners deployed. So you can see that the acoustic banners when they're down um, reduce that, uh, the reverberation levels in the, in the mid frequencies uh, by about sort of 0.15 or 0.2 seconds. Um, in terms of the, uh, the subjective outcomes, uh, we had Emma Dunch, who's the CEO of the Sydney Symphony. Uh, she said, we're thrilled uh, to have such a stunning kickoff to our Sydney Coliseum Theatre Showcase Series with the Rite of Spring being performed by the full orchestra to last night's packed house. We're very proud of our new venue partnership and to be playing in this amazing new piece of arts infrastructure and thank West HQ for their commitment to the arts and for their support of our goal to further develop the um, Sydney Symphony's audience in Greater Western Sydney. Um, it's, uh, it's difficult for me to give my subjective impressions because I'm of course terribly biased, um, but we have actually created a, a 3D um, video with spatial audio um, 
that we will send the link uh, around for. Um, and the way we did this was as part of our commissioning measurements, we measure the 3D impulse response of a number of seats and take um, 360 degree uh, photos. And so from that, we can um, basically convolve an anechoic recording with those 3D impulse responses and get, um, uh, get a, a real sense of what it sounds like in the auditorium. So particularly if you've got um, a VR, some way to view in VR, or even a, a cardboard box uh, viewer with your phone, um, definitely with headphones is the way to do it. Um, you'll get a sense of uh, what it sounds like um, in the theatre. As you pan your head around, you'll, you'll hear too the changes um, because it is, it is a spatial audio representation. But we can send that link um, around to all the attendees. Um, just uh, a few images to finish off with. Um, the external uh, shot, the foyer, which uh, is one of my personal favourite uh, parts of the building. Um, and then a few shots of the auditorium. So that about wraps it up for me. And as I said, we'll, uh, we'll send that link around, um, but I'm sure you can also find the uh, that 360 video on YouTube. So I'll hand back to you, Liam. Thanks for that, Matt. Um, I'll remind everyone now to put any questions you may have at the bottom in the Q&A panel. Um, we have had one or two that have come through. Just before we get to those, I'll um, remind you all that we do have that other webinar in two weeks time on Wednesday 15th of July, which will be given by Micah Johnson, who heads the Marshall Day Entertech, who Matt said is our theatre consultant division. And that one will be discussing issues such as fly towers and overstage machinery. So keep an eye out for an invitation to that one. So Matthew, um, a question that's come through is, can you speak more about the C80 target in particular? Um, was that a broadband uh, target? And also what was the difference with regards to the C80 for an acoustic store source on stage or loudspeaker array sources? Um, was there a difference in those or um, yeah, can you put any discussion towards that? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, the C80 target was a mid-frequency target. Um, so the 501k um, and the, uh, oh, the, the uh, between the, that, that was for um, the acoustic response of the room rather than via the sound system. And which modeling software was used to model the C80 um, results prior to obviously the measurements? Uh, uh, yeah, Odeon. So we used Odeon for all the um, room acoustic uh, modeling. And was there good, accurate, um, were the results fairly accurate in comparison to the Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Odeon's, uh, Odeon's quite, accurate, um, particularly if you sort of know, like any tool, um, you've got to sort of know the, the quirks of it. Um, but it did, the, the predicted results aligned very well with, with what we measured. Um, uh, although they did change the seat selection um, partway through uh, the design process. So we had to update those um, uh, the models, um, but but once they're updated, they uh, they aligned pretty well. Um, speaking of the seats, could you give a little more information as well towards the materials that were used for these seats and also for the banners? Uh, yeah, the uh, seats are a Jezet seat. Uh, they are European. I want to say Spanish, but. I could have that wrong, but J-E-Z-E-T. Um, and they're quite a comfortable seat. Um, uh, we're quite happy with them. They're probably not as, uh, in terms of the acoustics, they're probably not as absorptive as a traditional um, sort of full concert hall type seat. They're probably leaning a little bit more towards the, um, they're not a stadium seat, but they're, they're slightly less uh, plush than, um, 
and particularly in the arms than uh, than a traditional theatre mm-hmm. seat. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, having having sat through quite a few shows on them now, I'm, I'm very happy with how comfortable they are. <laughs> And oh, sorry. The, the banners. The banners, the banners well, are yeah. a Dan's banner. So there are. Um, there's actually two layers of fabric um, that roll down uh, from from each of those, uh, and that is something that's under the control of the um, the theatre. So they can um, deploy them or retract them depending on the uh, the show that they've got. Regarding the lateral walls with all those wood sl- wood slats, sorry, um, mm-hmm. were they designed to be diffusive? Yeah, that's right. So they're a, they're a, they're, they're diffusive basically. So that um, if you actually, if you go to the venue, you can actually see it as you come through the doors. You can look up and see the detail, but it's effectively a timber um, a timber batten that then has um, a solid uh, backing behind it. So it, um, you get that diffusive uh, effect. Now, here's another one. Um, were there any other specifically psychoacoustic metrics that you considered um, for the room acoustics design? And perhaps the asker of that question could um, put through which metrics there might be meaning specifically, unless you might have an idea, Matt? Uh, I, I, I think not. Um, we looked uh, really to the ISO metrics. Um, so we did specify, I think, uh, uh, reverb time, early decay, uh, lateral fraction we were looking for. Um, C80, uh, I think we specified a base rise. Um, yeah, I think they're the main main metrics. Okay, I think two more questions uh, might be good. Another one regarding the metrics again. Um, what parameters, were there specific parameters used for modeling the orchestra reflectors um, as opposed to the actual whole auditorium itself? Uh, no, the, um, given the, uh, the time and budget constraints on the, uh, the shell, and I think we had about, I can't remember, it was about four weeks or six weeks between when the trigger was pulled on that and when the first um, Sydney Symphony show came in. Uh, we used our experience basically um, We've done a lot of shells, uh, particularly up in, on the projects we do in China. Um, so we had a pretty good idea about how, uh, what we needed um, to achieve there. And by making them modular, um, it meant, and, and having them on the rigging system, it meant that they can be basically tuned, uh, op- open them up to become less intense um, for the performers, uh, or close them up to, um, to increase that level of reflectivity. Or coverage. Um, can you recall the average G values for the auditorium? Not off the top of my head. <laughs> no problem. Um, here's one. Two people have asked regarding the um, speaker distribution. So does the trend for surround sound system rather than frontal stage arrays change the way you design um, these types of venues acoustically? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, with this venue, as I said, the, the immersive audio came in, um, effectively the, the building was, was mostly constructed by the time, uh, that that came in. So we didn't have a lot of scope to change much. We did actually go back, um, to the Odeon model, uh, and look particularly at the level of, um, sound energy that we were going to be pushing onto the side walls. Um, the column arrays uh, are very good at um, steering sound um, in the, I guess, the vertical dimension, but they don't have the control in the horizontal. And we were concerned, I guess, about um, having now five arrays and, and, and the furthest two being quite close to the walls, whether we're going to be pushing too much energy onto the, um, the side walls and whether we uh, would look at 
um, adding absorption um, into uh, the side walls um, next to those uh, far left and right uh, arrays. Um, we didn't need to in the end, um, but, and the other thing I guess to note is that this system didn't have um, uh, speakers out in the auditorium. It didn't have the sort of surround uh, effect. Um, so uh, I think that probably would have to have to be considered a bit more carefully um, and may have more of an impact on the design than just the, um, the multiple front arrays. Okay. Um, and I think this one is, is related to the sound system as well. Um, for a theater like this one regarding the low frequency sound, does the low frequency get limited or rolled out at the end on site or does the design consider the frequency response of the system? Um, were there any limitations or compromises, compromises for low frequency response? Uh, no, no. I think I understand that question. <laughs> I think I'm answering yeah. that correctly. Well, I think also maybe regarding how much work is done mixing on site versus the design um, from the drawing board in terms of getting the adequate frequency response from the system. Uh, so El Acoustic actually sent a team of engineers from France out to do the commissioning and they spent about a week on site um, tuning the system to the room. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, I see. Um, so from a production perspective, um, you know, if Tina Arena comes in and her uh, sound guy um, then creates his mix but doesn't need to modify the, the, the system response. Yeah. Um, and I think to date they've had no one bring in an external um, system. Everyone has come in and used the, the in-house system. No problem. Okay, one final question here given the height of the room uh at the front of the room how do you simulate the nc level from the air diffusers what was the average air supply velocities uh that's a that's a uh with great difficulty is probably the short answer um uh, the other thing to consider is how many diffusers there are in a room that size um so we we did have obviously the the Odeon model um, at that point. So we could, you, you could actually go down to a per diffuser um, basis and uh, and create a source at each point and, and model it in Odeon to tell you what the transfer function is. Um, but uh, I don't think we did actually do that in practice. But we used um, we used an in house tool uh, called. A down duct, which is uh, basically a super complicated spreadsheet <laughs> based system. Um, but I, the, the most difficult bit is actually getting from the manufacturers uh, what those diffuser sound power levels are, um, because you tend to be at the extremes of, um, of the design for those diffusers. So um, it's whether they've actually, they've actually tested down to the noise levels and the flow levels you're looking at. Okay, um, while well, we've been answering that, that I said was the final one, but I think we can squeeze in just uh, one more before 12. Uh, did you take into account the deep seat effect for low frequency control of the reverberation time, the reverberation curve. So I think he saw, uh, the questioner saw that there was a gap in the low frequencies. Um, now perhaps, I'm not sure exactly what's meant by the deep seat effect here. Yeah, so I think he's talking about the roll off the, the um, I mean, it's a, it's a frequency dependent um, absorption that you get off the top of the, the rows of seats. Um, we, uh, we've, a lot of that's going to be dependent on the, the seats and the configuration. Um, so we had a set of seats 
uh, a seeding bank tested in a lab. And so we had those results. Um, right. The other thing I'd say about that spectrum is that uh, I think the spectrum in the slideshow is uh, from memory. It's just a, a typical spectrum taken at a, uh, a point. Um, so uh, it, it's maybe not, um, not actually indicative of the average across the room, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. Great. Well, I think um, we might just have to wrap it up there. Of course, if anyone has any further questions or comments, wishes to get in touch, all of our details are on the website. Um, thank you very much to you, Matthew. And um, did you have any closing remarks or anything that you wanted to say before we... Uh, no, that's fine. Thanks everyone for uh, coming. And I think we'll, um, we'll send around that YouTube uh, link if uh, people are interested. And um, yeah. Great. All right. Well, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day and hope to see you at the next webinar. See you later.